So I spoke about something that nobody knew about, a lost land at Knott's Berry Farm called the Gypsy Camp. Now let's continue that little story. The Gypsy Camp was 1971 to about 1974. Uh, Marion Knott, who created this little section of the park, realized that it wasn't going anywhere. People were walking up to these paper bag facades that looked like caves and not doing anything. It was a massive failure and it breaks my heart to say that it was just an absolute dud of a design. In 1974 they were looking at this landscape of rocks that nobody wanted to go to and decided that they were going to be making a change. They didn't really understand what the change would be, but they thought, how can we improve this area? And for those of you who have no idea what you're looking at, I'm going to point and actually tell you where you are in this park. If you look at that entrance doorway, Coming Big Jake, starring John Wayne, for those of you who know Knott's Berry Farm, that is now the entrance to the candy shop in the Roaring Twenties Boardwalk area. That doorway still exists as the candy shop doorway. This entire area is Charleston Circle, and way off in the distance, we have a doorway here. That is the doorway now for the Nautilus shop, which sells Elvira merchandise at Halloween Haunt. <laughs> They've refaced this entire area, keeping the John Wayne Theater, which is now the Charles Schultz Theater, you'll see it soon, and they just ripped it all down in order to create something new. Marion Knott knew that she wanted to improve the area, and she asked Wally Huntoon, a graphic designer, could we possibly plus this up? Could we make it more attractive? Could we keep Gypsy Camp and just add to it? So he wound up adding banners and ropes and flyers in order to create a lovely little area that was a little bit more inviting than all that dead rock work. Uh, in this image, we have the entrance to the, the Gypsy Camp Bazaar, and way up on top of that, we have the Hammock of the Gypsy King. No, this really wasn't going to succeed at all. Uh, perhaps we could decorate with chickens. No. <laughs> the chicken idea also didn't take off, and Wally Huntoon's designs were thrown out the window. Marion Knott decided in 1974 that she was going to go to somebody else, and she wound up asking a guy named Raleigh Crump. She said, Raleigh, what are we going to do with this area? They were eradicating Gypsy Camp, but not sure what to do with it. Roaring Twenties was a possibility, but Marion kept changing her mind. For those of you who are not familiar with the cinder blocks that you're looking at, I will point out again that this doorway here, right there, that's the entrance to the Nautilus gift shop. Everything else is still there, including these two vertical windows, believe it or not. That would eventually become Knox Berry Tales. But it took this guy, a former Walt Disney Imagineer who worked under Walt himself and quit after Walt's death in order to form his <coughs> own little studio. Raleigh decided, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. He had been working on Circus World in Florida. That never came to be. He came back to Los Angeles about September of 1974, and Marion Knott tapped him, could you please come up with a few ideas for this gypsy camp revival area? Uh, he has experience with gypsies. Here's his own gypsy wagon that he designed for the Disney Studios Museum of the Weird. He has a great hand in these things. This hand that you have seen all over Disney is about to hit Knott's Berry Farm. He wound up coming up with some fantastic ideas and adapted them for an ever-changing concept that could become Berry Tales. But it didn't start as the Berry Tales. It started as the Gypsy Fair. They were still focused on this Gypsy concept that Wally Huntoon had, had developed and this gypsy concept continued. They were going to build a 20,000 square foot dark ride, an enormous space to fill with something. Wally Huntoon said, well, it's going to be a boy on his burrow going to the fair. That was the concept. Raleigh took it and he went with it in a completely different direction. His hand is all over this thing. And these characters that you see now, look at the gowns that these characters are wearing, because you're going to be seeing these exact costumes pop up later. 
this attraction began about September of 1974 and opened nine months later. Still blown away. So the Gypsy Fair was a cute little attraction. You'd start in the factory, go to the forest, hit the fortune-telling camp, go to the woods, and then see a fair. That idea of the Gypsy Fair didn't change very much. It just kept getting altered slightly. For example, in these illustrations, we see the Gypsy family with a bear at the Grand Carnival finale. This is a painting that was done in order to pitch the concept to the Knott family. Uh, with artwork such as this, and this, Raleigh Crump actually took this idea to Walter Knott himself, who was not the head of Knott's Berry Farm at the time, it was his daughter Marion that was really deciding all of these things, uh, sat down in the family farm house, which is just over that away, and pitched the concept to all of the Knott children and grandchildren in order to say, this is what you could have. At this point in time, the Gypsy Fair, even though this might look familiar to fans of the attraction, it's not filled with beautiful, cute bears. No, it's filled with gypsies. There's still gypsies here and there. Instead of making jams and jellies, these gypsies are making marionettes and puppets. I know. It's a great aesthetic attraction, but it hadn't quite hit the groove yet. One of the ideas that did pop up and stick was the frog forest. The frog forest was a very cute area filled with giant mushrooms and frogs. It was incredibly psychedelic, a word I'm probably going to use multiple times in this conversation. <laughs> but these are the images that, Wally, that Raleigh used in order to pitch the concept. The gypsy camp itself, these illustrations were based on some of Raleigh's designs for gypsies when they were still in their human form. Fantastic ideas, incredible concepts, and they, they did not really evolve. However, we do see something big changing because we're about to watch the human beings switch. Raleigh Crump did have a design in which he introduced some bears. Bears were part of the puppet-making crew, not Berry Bears. They hadn't quite put the bear in Berry yet, but they were still focusing on those gypsies, and that's about the time that Marion Knott said, well, why don't we take this to a committee? And that's when Raleigh Crump went, are you kidding me? Disney never did committees. <laughs> they took it to a marketing team in order to see, hey, what do people want? Do they like these gypsies, or what about the bears? Everybody said, no, we like the bears. And the bears wound up taking over. It became not Berry Tales in committee because everybody seemed to like the critters more than the human-ish cartoon people. The bears wound up taking over, and we see the bears absolutely everywhere, even panda bears. So in the gypsy camp alone, all of these great gypsy camp designs wound up getting adapted. Uh, we see some of these familiar characters in their wonderful gowns. The costumes don't change, but the species does. <laughs> all of these designs are Raleigh Crump. They're so, how do I say, Crumpian? In their aesthetic, every little detail, every little curly cue, uh, his hand is everywhere in this. Even from the dawn of the attraction, when it was still human characters, the designs for the costumes carry through all the way to cons completion. I can possibly do a step one, step two, and then a final step for each and one of every one of these pieces. It was Marion Knott who finally, finally put the nail in it and said, it's going to be the Roaring Twenties. She had beaten back and forth about this idea, let's keep it the gypsy camp and we'll just plus it up. Then she said, let's make it an extension of Ghost Town, and then it became the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties, as we remember it in our childhood, the Roaring Twenties was an area that celebrated, Marian, celebrated Marion's uh, parents, Walter and Cordelia. Walter and Cordelia came to Los Angeles, or came to Buena Park, sorry, in 1920. That's when they first came to this Knott's Berry Farm in 1920. So it, just as Walter Knott had looked back to honor his parents with Ghost Town, Marion looked to honor her parents with the Roaring Twenties. 
I could beat that over the head and give you lots of Buena Vista Street references, but I won't. I'm just going to say, Knox did it first. They honored their founder who came to this area in the 1920s and created a lovely 1920s landscape with the Charleston Fountain right in the middle of it. And Berry Tales came to be. The Knott's Berry Tales name stuck. The concept was here. They knew exactly what they were going to do, and they had no time to do it. Raleigh Crump said yes to this in September of 1974. They were to open in July of 1975. With illustrations such as these, wonderfully rare illustrations that have come from Knott's Preserved, Chris Merritt and Raleigh himself, they wound up taking these concepts and saying, okay, now who can we get to build this? Raleigh Crump Studio 27, they were going to be the head engineer of this entire concept, but they needed to hire somebody who could actually pull it off, and they wound up going to a company called Fantasy Fair. Fantasy Fair looked at all of these illustrations. By the way, Bear standing on a stool, sipping jelly from a straw, you'll see that later too. All of these came to be in the final drawing, in the final, final, uh, final build. So they wound up going to Fantasy Fair. Fantasy Fair was located on Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood, and they had experience in designing window displays for Disneyland. They did window displays for Disneyland and all sorts of other things for Hollywood, but this is the first time they'd ever had the opportunity to build a dark ride. They came up with a number. Looking at all of these illustrations, the possibilities, blueprints, plans, the floor plan of the proposed building that was then under construction, and the folks at Fantasy Fair said, okay, I think we can do this. I think we can do this for $600,000. And Raleigh Crump said, why don't we put a little cushion in there, maybe make it $900,000, and then we'll go to Knott's Berry Farm and see if the family can come up with the money. They did. They built this for $900,000. I still can't believe that. So some of these things did actually come to be. Sadly, El Frago did not make the cut. <laughs> but the balancing act of frogs actually did. It did get constructed. From these illustrations, all of these creatures, including the snicken that just rolled in, the snail chicken. <laughs> the snicken got constructed, even the legged fish in a top hat. All of these designs popped out of Raleigh's Crump, Raleigh Crump's pen, and they got made. Raleigh Crump did not ever have an issue with Marion saying, change anything. The Knott family stood back and let this experienced designer do what he did best, which was build a weird, bizarre fantasy world. And you're not going to build a weird, bizarre fantasy world until you build a model of it. Some of these folks that were on uh, the Studio 27 team and also in Fantasy Fair wound up later going on to Epcot Center. Most of these people that had a hand in this attraction wound up becoming Disney Imagineers when Epcot Center was under construction. That fellow in the far left is Steve Kirk. He wound up working with Tony Baxter and a team. You know this fellow? You know this fellow. He wound up being one of the hands that helped create Dreamfinder and Figment for Epcot Center. I love Dreamfinder. Exactly. And where did this man learn his talent and hone his craft? But at Knott's Berry Farm. He was a very young fella, as were all of these folks, when they wound up making models. These models were built. Oh, that's him again, by the way. All of these models were built by hand, of course, with little putty clay and cardboard and what? That stuff. That stuff. Forget what it's called. That lichen and lichen. In order to pitch the concept to Knott's Berry Farm, they built these beautiful little models and then wound up lighting them and taking pictures of them to further pitch the idea to the family to make sure that this is the direction that they were going to be going in. Illustrations are one thing, but actually making a model and putting it under professional lighting is another. The family again said, yes, go for it. We're not going to change our minds. This is exactly what we want. They wound up creating this beautiful little model with almost every scene intact 
including the gypsy gown. And there's that swirly blue gown again on Wanda Skunk. Uh, even Theta Bear gets in the act with her Queen of Hearts looking outfit. I mean, everything that's here, almost everything, uh, wound up getting made and then put under blacklight. This is the Chug-a-Chug machine. The Chug-a-Chug machine was the centerpiece of the factory area. I'll show you some pictures of that later. Now, all of these models were a, high, a big success, and they wound up producing this thing. They were building it at Fantasy Fair on Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood, taking all of these pieces and building them on Santa Monica Boulevard. They were constructing hundreds of frogs. They were dressing Dr. Fox, building faux model tees, uh, designing evil trees, and also painting an enormous load area mural. The load area mural was inspired by the Fantasyland load area murals in which you were about to board your car and you could see a mural tracing your fun experience that you're about to have. That giant canvas uh, wall did the exact same thing. It showed you where your experience was going to take you. Uh, we even have a little photograph on the far left of the exit area on the attraction itself as it was under construction. The fun part about this, and this is something I absolutely love, is that they built these things to the scale that Raleigh Crump drew them. Raleigh Crump wound up drawing every single character on butcher paper. He drew every character on butcher paper at the scale that he wanted them. That's that. Those are the drawings at full scale, every one of them. And then they wound up measuring those drawings and making the actual <laughs> creature. There's uh, the dragon from Madame Wong's, I believe. The illustration and the final piece. That's how they wound up doing it. They just sketched out ideas. They were incredibly rough sketches, but they did it. These are pieces of what would become the chug-a-chug machine. Uh, plungers and spinners and everything. And this is, of course, Chris Crump. Raleigh Crump wasn't going to work on this project without saying, Chris, I need my son to be a part of this. And you know Chris? Yes, you know Chris. Uh, Chris Crump was involved in this project. He was a really good carpenter. Raleigh Crump said he knew that his son was a great carpenter and said, I'm putting you in charge of building the Chug-a-Chug machine. The Chug-a-Chug was the centerpiece of the factory. It was this gigantic contraption of whirring and spinning and gears and disco balls that was constantly moving all around you while you wound your way through that fantastic factory. It wound up looking a little bit like this in its final construction. It was shiny and golden and every little bit of it moved. It was popping and spinning and whirring as these big gears would spin. The ping pong balls on them would slide with gravity and make a popping noise as it spun. They had uh, bingo ball spinners as well with popping balls spinning in the bingo. It was insanity. And it impresses me today that these sketches that they just roughly drew became true. They did exactly that in the chug-a-chug machine with every little bit of pieces, every little weird material you can imagine. For example, toilet plungers. Whatever was easy and cheap, just go to the 99 cent store, grab it, and we'll throw it in here and paint it gold. Everything was a part of the chug and chug machine. And it made a big difference. It was a big kinetic thing in this attraction. For the gypsy camp, they wound up constructing full-size gypsy wagons. They had about five of them in this attraction, and each one was designed in 360. Because as the cars were moving, winding through the gypsy camp, you could see all sides of these cars. So they wound up painting every little bit of them, and each one was a masterpiece of black light design. Sketches for the Smoker 27. That could describe Raleigh himself. He, he was in charge of the Studio 27, and he was a smoker. <clears throat> what he was smoking, he admitted later, but... It's legal tomorrow. These designs, yes, it's legal now. These particular designs came true. They totally came true. Uh, to stand back and look at these things, every little square inch became reality. Even down to the stove. 
the Sunshine Stove. It's big, it's 66 inches wide and drawn to a scale. But even that, with the Sunshine Stove door, even that became a reality. And it was a big, glowing, black light, psychedelic reality. The fact that these things were created exactly from Raleigh Croft's drawings just turned this thing into a gigantic Raleigh Crump dreamscape. A dreamscape that, to be personal, I grew up with and miss to this day. I'm just gonna take a break. Did anybody get to experience that, or is it just me? Yay, yes, you know what I'm talking about. That landscape was so bizarre and weird, but I'm not even done yet, not even done. We still have more to see. So even things like the pie rack, the pie rack on the far left, that got created, it's right there on the far left. Here's some more of their designs. They were still stuck with that gypsy design. The gypsy camp came, the gypsy camp followed their storyline as they went to the Roaring Twenties. And that 1970s hand of incredible floral detail flowed all over every piece of furniture in the entire building. Um, all of it was painted on site in Santa Monica and then brought on Santa Monica Boulevard and then brought to Knott's Berry Farm. And in the background you can see certain full-scale drawings for characters like Wanda Skunk and some of the raccoons. Even characters from the Weird Woods pop up on the walls in the backgrounds of these images. Other pieces that were designed on site, the bathtub for Weird Juice, all of these things. They came out of the mind of this brilliantly <coughs> mad man and in nine months became a reality. They were totally on schedule. Everything was going smoothly. This is the Roaring Twenties under construction. Fairy Tales is moving in up there. In the distance, we see the bumper cars pavilion being constructed. Down the way, uh, Foods of Fortune is being turned into what is now Hollywood Hits. It was all going smoothly. <laughs> until fire destroyed everything. Oh. Yeah. Now, here comes the true story behind this. This is March. March? Yep, March 27th, 1975. Now, the people that were building the Roaring Twenties area, <clears throat> they were union workers, and the folks that were installing the attraction for Fantasy Fair were not union workers. Uh, Raleigh Crump actually told the Knott family, maybe we should hold back and let them finish building their buildings before we start moving our stuff in. And the Knott family told Raleigh Crump, no, don't worry about it, everything's cool. They started moving their stuff in with union workers building the building and non-union workers <coughs> installing the interiors. And just a few months later, the whole thing went up in smoke, started by five individual fires at at five corners of the attraction. Hmm. At about 5 p.m. or so um, on March 27th. Yeah, they didn't lose the characters, but they lost the entire chug-a-chug -chug machine, and they lost all of the rock work. Let's take, some, let's take a look at some of the photos of the damage. So opening in three months, this is Knott's Berry Tales. They had spent time and money and so much effort in order to build out this interior. The track system was already installed. Uh, in fact, there's the track system with Marion not inspecting the damage. It was horrifying that this had happened. Terrible. And everybody knew what had happened. But nothing came of it. Nothing. It was an unknown arson fire that was never solved. Never solved. Marion not was adamant that they would open on time, that they would still open Berry Tales on July 4th, just a few months away. Uh, yes, she said, we will be opening right on time, absolutely right on time. Well, no, it didn't happen that way. Uh, they did build a new chug chug machine. They had an extension of time. They were given six weeks to extend and finish and clean up and build all of Berry Tales completely over again. Uh, in designing this new Chugga Chug, it took Chris Crump three months to build the original. Three months. And he did the second one in six weeks. 
And when he redid that second one, he re-labeled it. <coughs> Chugga Chug number two. <laughs> and that's the one that actually got installed in the attraction. The exterior of the building, it's changed just a little bit. Just a little bit. We still have those archways. The arcade is tucked over just underneath it. Over to the side, we now have Johnny Rockets, and sadly, that gorgeous neon sign was thrown into the trash just a few years ago. But this is the 1970s when that beautiful attraction finally opened. The exterior screamed, come inside. It was a beautiful neon archway. You walked inside with your B ticket up a ramp boarding your car, and once you stepped inside, you had a loading ramp off to your left, and you rode a Los Angeles red car, a recreation of a Los Angeles red car, as you rode through a Knott's Berry Tales storybook and into the fantasy world of Knott's Berry Tales itself. Let's take a look inside. You won't be seeing these characters inside, but this, these are the three walk-around characters that Knott's developed in order to entertain guests on the streets of the Roaring Twenties. Knott's Berry Farm has tried and tried and tried to have masked walk-around characters, and they just kept failing. These guys, sadly, didn't succeed very much. Uh, but they did give it a shot. They gave it a shot to such a degree that they had to put buttons on the characters with the character's name on it so people knew who they were, because these are not Mickey and Minnie. Not at all. Um, by the way, the two, the two female heads of these walk-around characters still survive. The heads are at the Orange County, uh, Orange County Archives in Santa Ana. But let's step inside. The very first thing that you're going to be seeing, the first thing that you encounter, you get a big whiff of the scent of boysenberries, and you enter the cannery and kitchen. Did this go? There we go. With the chug a chug machine clanking and clacking, we have the first Berry Tales characters spinning around. Everything is in motion. Your ride vehicle is whirring through, and you are hit by the overwhelming scent of boysenberries. This entire attraction smelled like boysenberries, and that was very important to Raleigh Crump. He rode the log ride just a few feet away. He rode the log ride that was designed by Bud Hurlbut, and Bud Hurlbut had hit that ride with the scent of evergreens. So as you ride through it, you have that powerful scent of evergreens. It was scent rama in an attraction. And he said, I want that. How much is it going to cost in order to add berry scent to this attraction? He found out and wound up getting it. It was a boysenberry scented ride. Well, actually, I'm going to take a tangent for a second. Even after they ripped this out and they built Kingdom of the Dinosaurs, for a year, Kingdom of the Dinosaurs <laughs> felt like boys and bears. <laughs> I will stick by that. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Some of the sights that you're going to be seeing, that chug a chug machine is absolutely everywhere. Off to the corner, we have a bear sucking jelly out of a straw. We have uh, the bears actually mixing their jams with sugar and glue on the far left in the preserving department and all of these other little scenes taking place. The bears are very, very busy. The bears are busy with their Smoker 27. We have a bear pulling his sausage off of the center of the scene. That sounds horrible. <laughs> Another bear chopping wood. Everything was in motion. You were going through a gigantic window display and everything was in motion. There was sound everywhere. You were listening to the soundtrack a little bit earlier. Music was all over the place. And it was a mixture of black light and incandescent. Um, as you were going through this scene, your eyes were adjusting. Raleigh Krupp took this under consideration, and he built what is believed to be the very first dark ride that was a combination of black light and incandescent light. The Walt Disney Company did not believe that you could build a black light ride with incandescent light bulbs. So all of the attractions at Walt Disney World that Raleigh Crump had a hand in, all of those dark rides were black light UV only. Raleigh Crump decided that he was going to make a mixture of those, and he wound up giving your eyes a chance to adjust. This very first scene was mostly incandescent lighting, allowing your sunburnt eyes from the outside time to adjust to the dark ride inside. 
Next up, we travel into the frog forest, and it is filled with a hundred burping, chirping frogs. Every one of them is popping. All of their heads are bobbing and moving. There's a, a lake right in the middle of this room, and there's weird, bizarre mushrooms growing everywhere, just adding to the bizarre psychedelic nature of this scene. When this flash photo was taken, they were just about to rip out the attraction. The lake in the center was drained. The water wheel was no longer pouring water. The frog that was pouring a water can over a mushroom with real water that had been turned off, but a lot of this was still in beautiful, shiny order the day it closed. In a far corner, we had the frog jumping contest with frogs bouncing up and down in this weird black light. Everything in this scene was incredibly bizarre black light with layer upon layer of mushroom houses for the frogs to live in. The mushrooms were growing one on top of each other in this bizarre scene, and it was just depth so many layers of depth in order to see from here to there. The toad for a day, even the toads had their own gypsy wagons and uh, they were doing gymnastics in the corner until you finally reached the gypsy camp. And once you did reach the gypsy camp, you were in a full 100% black light environment. In adding to the weirdness of this scene, everything was black light, day glow, glowing, sharp, bright colors and it was layered, densely layered with signage and cards and drapery and there's Theta Bear in her Queen of Hearts outfit uh, magically raising cards on the table. The characters themselves, remember when these were human characters just a few months ago? These human characters changed into skunks and foxes and bears. The costumes remain the same. The costumes as they were made were, were to match Raleigh Crump's actual designs. So every little bit of this attraction was a Raleigh Crump dream. And I'm going to actually say it and embarrass myself. It's a Raleigh Crump wet dream. It's just, <laughs> holy cow, one of the best things that he's ever done because he had 100% control from his pen to the final product. It was made just as his eye had designed it. Uh, frogs and wagons and even these psychedelic uh, floral prints, every little detail of this space was just layer upon layer of detail. The treescapes changed from scene to scene in the gypsy camp area and into the weird woods. The trees were actually <laughs> draped uh, with layers of painted mesh so that the leaves looked like they were floating in a black light space as you went under and through them. The trees were two-dimensional, but looked like they had depth and reality to them as you were in motion down the track. You were going past characters such as Wanda, your cup will tell. I mean, every little bit of this is just a psychedelic wonderland. Sarah <coughs> knows all. <laughs> and yes, all of these characters are still, well, amazing. And in a black light world as a child, yeah, it just swept you into another realm. The Weird Woods was indeed weird, a complete black light area. You've left the gypsy camp, you've now traveled in the Weird Woods, and the strangest mashup creatures exist in here, like these long-legged stilt characters, and there's bizarre caverns, and in these caverns are even more bizarre mashup characters. Uh, this is where we're going to find the, the, these bizarre creatures making weird juice. I can't tell you anything about what's going on in this. <laughs> Cannot. But I'm just grateful that somebody snapped a flash picture of it so we could see it all. Uh, and yes, those are Sparklet's water containers because they built this for $900,000. <laughs> they just used whatever they had at hand, painted it a weird color, and in it went. Uh, there's even more characters, more weird caves with the spooky eyes of our pie thief looking at you through the cavern. Yeah, it's bizarre. Oh, by the way, <coughs> beautiful, beautiful, all of those lashes, the, the vines of leaves, all of that was done by hand. It was basically, and I got to see an example of this recently, it's a uh, very heavy cardboard, almost hand-cut leaves, 
on a string separated by straws. That's how they did it for $900,000. <laughs> It was cardboard leaves with straws, keeping them all from sliding into place, knots tied into the, the vines to keep it all from falling if it, if it cut. It's amazing the things that they put together. Well, the Weird Woods had a fish with a top hat and legs. Remember when Raleigh Crump drew this just a few months ago, and then it became a reality. The, the spider cave also was part of the, the attraction, and then we finally reached the fair. Oh, the fair itself was home to the, the Jazzberry Band. <clears throat> the Jazzberry Band. They were part of the scene playing the music that you were hearing all throughout. This particular scene is a combination of black light and incandescent, allowing your eyes to convert back to daylight as you reached your grand finale. Dr. Fox might look familiar. He's very much like our, very much like our villain in this, but... <clears throat> The Weird Wood characters have actually come out. It's a grand finale with a little bit of everybody because we're going to be seeing some of the gypsies, some fair characters, some brand new rabbit family that came out of nowhere, a giant chicken and a goat. There's even a, a full balloon and more gypsy wagons to be found. And of course our pie thief is exhausted because he has eaten far too many pies that he is all Stolen from the stolen from the fair, uh, crafty coyote. My God, crafty coyote is fantastic. By the way, this is a really good illustration. That illustration of crafty coyote should be made into a T-shirt or something. <laughs> <laughs> you continue your travel as you exit, going through this wonderful black black light landscape, waving to familiar characters. It is incredible that all of these vines of trees were cut and woven into fabric and mesh by hand, it blows my mind. The handmade signage, this was not done on a computer, every little bit of that was made by hand. And as we leave the ride, we're saying goodbye to the Berry Tales family with boysenberry and girlsenberry and raspberry and elderberry. <clears throat> yes, every one <laughs> member of that family Raz and Flapper, Elder, Boys and, and Girls, and they were all there in the attraction. And it was amazing. He built that ride in nine months with an extra six weeks to make up for a fire. They built that attraction in nine months, practically with slave labor. In fact, I'm friends with a guy who said that he was about nine years old and he would come here after school and help them paint. And he made no money. <clears throat> but that's okay, he got tickets in return to come to Knott's. They built an amazing, incredible attraction. Something that has stuck with me and made me love this park ever since I was a child. It was a Raleigh Crump dreamscape that existed for only 11 years. That's it. Just 11 years. And then a new CEO came in and he said, let's rip it out. To be oh, perfectly that's why honest, it closed. I was wondering why it closed. <clears throat> it, it closed for a couple of reasons. L let me explain. Now that attraction was psychedelic. There was nothing like it. But it was built with a shoestring, built on a shoestring, and after literally, I'm sure they had shoestrings in there somewhere. <laughs> it was built with a shoestring. Um, but I, I, I really personally believe, and there's nothing to document this, that there was just not a lot of maintenance going on. Halloween Haunt was developed at the very same time as the Roaring Twenties in this attraction. This attraction was used in haunt after haunt after haunt. And after they went in and decorated it all with Halloween monsters and had a whole bunch of teenagers running through it, rattling and bumping things, then they would take all the tarps off and say, yeah, it's back to normal again. Not quite so. It didn't receive the maintenance and love every November that it probably should have, and it got beaten down after 11 years of Halloween haunts. This is the final photograph of the last ride. Car number one is being pulled back through the station for its end. And after this, they're going to start ripping it out. It made one more Halloween haunt in this form, and then it was gone by November. Everything was being ripped out and thrown off a back wall off the second floor of this building and into dumpsters below. 
in order to make way for Kingdom of the Dinosaurs, which opened just a few years later, about 1987. It too was built with just nine months of time. And in this world, they wound up cutting corners by keeping the trees from Knott's Berry Tales. <laughs> for those of you who didn't realize it, that was the same track layout as Knott's Berry Tales. The same trees from Knott's Berry Tales. They just painted it to look a little bit more realistic with not much black light. I have to give kudos though. This was a damn good ride. I can still hear that soundtrack in my head, but I can still smell the boys and berries from Berry Tales. <laughs> Things like <clears throat> this, and I'm giving you a slight preview that nobody else has seen. This was my pitch a few years ago, just a few pages, of Berry Tales 2.0. Because when I was working here and somebody said, hey, let's repurpose that second floor with a shoot 'em up ride, I said, hey, you could totally translate fairy tales into a shoot 'em up ride. <laughs> but you could. <clears throat> in one scene, you're catching berries, and another, or in one scene, you're throwing berries, and another scene, you're throwing playing cards, and another scene, you're squirting water at growing mushrooms and frogs. I pitched the idea. <laughs> And it didn't succeed. For some reason, somebody said, oh, I don't know about these frogs and bears that we own that were designed by an amazing Imagineer with a catchy soundtrack. Let's build robotic fish instead. <clears throat> but there are still bits of fairy tales that pop up once in a while. For two years, we actually had this lovely scene. We got to re-enjoy the fairy tales attraction when somebody who was working here at the time, me, wound up building this little thing as a tribute to Berry Tales, where kids could come to the Boysenberry Festival and build their little Boysenberry tarts and, well, kind of enjoy themselves in a universe of Berry Tales also done on an absolute shoestring with no money. But that's okay. These characters were fantastic and they lived on. And even though we don't have Berry Tales today, there are still bits and pieces that survive. Believe it or not, there are fans, fans like myself, who have even created tribute artwork to Knott's Berry Tales. Believe it or not, there are people out there who have or have not ever ridden this attraction. But they've seen the photographs, they've listened to it, celebrated it, and even designed fan art, modern fan art, based on those characters. I'm flabbergasted. Some people are even crazy enough to have these characters tattooed on their bodies. <laughs> I'm speaking to you, Aubrey. <laughs> but I'm very impressed, too. For those of you who didn't realize that the absolute fan is sitting amongst us, he has the characters tattooed on his body. Wow. It's incredible. And, <clears throat> hey look, it's me. Aww. With some of the characters. Believe it or not, some of these characters really physically survived. They were thrown out the back of this building. Knotts did not give a damn about these characters and said, sure, you want them? Take them away. And there was one employee who pulled up with a big old truck, and he did. He took away a gigantic chunk of this attraction, and he's had it in storage for decades. I got to see some of these figures that were in storage for decades. Look familiar? The smoker still exists. It's there, look at that paint job. It's incredible that these things survived. And they're in this one guy's private collection, friend of the family, friend of ours. And I'm kind of shocked that they look as good as they do. Recognize the stove? <clears throat> Imagine me falling to my knees and crying when I got to see that stove again. I can't believe that these things still exist and the paint job is original and still intact. Even characters like Sarah Skunk with her robes that Raleigh Crump designed with stars on the sleeves, she's still with us. Even her Rhoda hairdo is that, that thing. That thing's still, still there too. Uh, a lot of that hand-painted signage has survived. This guy wound up saving some of the most amazing pieces of this attraction. Tea Leaf Readings by Wanda, still with us. I, I, I'm flabbergasted that these things have lasted, that these things are still here, and that I'm, I'm friends with a guy who owns them. It makes me so happy. All right, how could I possibly conclude this? I'm going to be, I'm going to say this. Knott's Berry Tales only lasted 11 years. 
it's a piece of my childhood and a piece that's still very strong inside of me. It's a Raleigh Crump dreamscape that I wish would come back to life. If anybody had the money to rebuild it from scratch, it would be awesome, sending that into the universe. But in the meantime, I hope that all of you have enjoyed your walk through the past to go see Knott's Berry Tales in two dimensions on film. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.